A mythology is not an ideology. It is not something projected from the brain, but something experienced from the heart, from recognitions of identities behind or within the appearances of nature, perceiving with a love a thou where there would have been otherwise only an it. The purpose of prayer and religious seeking is to see the truth about reality, to see what is. And at the bottom of what is is always goodness. The foundation is always love. Here is a mantra that we might repeat throughout our day. God's life is living itself in me. I am aware of life living itself in me. We cannot live in the presence of God. We are totally surrounded by God. Once I can see the mystery here and trust the mystery, even in this piece of clay that I am, then I can also see it in you. We are eventually able to see the transparent image within ourselves, in each other, and in all things. Finally, the seeing is one. How we see anything is how we will see everything. God beneath you, God in front of you, God behind you, God above you, God within you. Enchantment with being, the love of reality, joyous stillness. Uh, enchantment is a very helpful word for this state of being. Uh, maybe you've been enchanted at various times in your life with various things, like, you know, the first lover that you really resonated with uh, was perhaps an enchanting experience. Or perhaps you've found a community of people somewhere that was really enchanting, or a period in your life that was enchanting, or, or work relationship that was, well, this is it, you know, th this is enchanting. So we have a lot of juice cent centered around the word enchanting uh, as some of those really great moments of, of our living. To be enchanted with being is to be enchanted with literally everything, the ups and the downs of life. And enchanted is just such a powerful thing. That, that's, that's the most, to be enchanted with being is the most intense kind of enchantment. To be enchanted with being is enchantment beyond enchantment. Uh, that's a, the kind of thing, it's kind of a glow added to everything. It's, it's a kind of a brilliancy sort of added to everything. Enchantment with being is intensification. But it's not necessarily emotionally ecstatic. Enchantment with being can be very quiet, more subtle, joyous stillness. It can be rest. It can be just a glow to everything. Science is, at least in part, informed worship. The most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. He to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer pause to wonder and stand rapt in awe, is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. O oh God, if I worship you in fear of hell, burn me in hell. If I worship you in hope of paradise, shut me out of paradise. But if I worship you for your own sake, do not withhold from me your everlasting beauty. As Bernard of Clairvaux affirmed long ago, there are four degrees of love. First, we learn to love ourselves for our own sake. Second, we learn to love God for our own sake. Third, we gradually learn to love God for God's sake. Fourth, we learn to love ourselves for God's sake. True love is loving God above all else. 
for God's sake alone. True love is loving others for God's sake. True love is also loving yourself for God's sake. In this virtue of love, God is love for God's sake alone, above all other creatures and things on earth. This is well and good. The heart of love is being loved by God and learning to love ourselves for God's sake. This love is discovered in the naked movement of your being toward God. It takes poetry to get a hold of this stuff, and I, I think maybe you can f feel some of that. This love of self does not mean loving your addictions and your refusal to live your life. It means loving getting out your true self. It means loving that authentic deposit of you that is there for the releasing. Uh, it's autonomous strength to love yourself, to realize that you are a unique, separate being and there's no substitute for you, and that you are a power. You are a strength. Uh, and it's, it's a kind of aloneness, but it's not loneliness, not you're missing somebody. You're, you're finding yourself in your strength, in your autonomous strength, in your courageous heart. All creation is meant for bhakti rather than for bhoga. All creation is transparent. There is transparency within oneself and that the energy which moves each is the same that moves the entire universe. As water takes the shape of its container, the mind, when it contemplates an object, is transformed into the shape of that object. Without concentration on the transparent mystery which shapes and controls the universe, one cannot unlock the transparent mystery within oneself or become a universal human being. There is no other when you have become the other, and the other is you. It is compassion, one and yet distinct from everything. The ultimate reality is the capacity for infinite relationship. In this becoming, everything comes into being. Only ultimate reality matters, and for that reason, everything matters. Above all, we must serve God's love and plan for the new creation. Don't look for big things. Just do small things with great love. The smaller the thing, the greater must be our love. One way to understand what the Bible means by the word God is just to put the signature of the letter X every time the word God appears and then solve these sentences for God. This works very well with the thinking of Paul. If you just take Paul's writing on God, like in the first chapter of Romans, and just put X everywhere he puts God and read it, uh, it begins to be clear what Paul means by God. X is invisible, but the effects of X are not invisible. Everything that has the power of being is empowered by X. Humans cannot get their minds around X, but their deep inner beings discern the presence of X. Clearly, X is the awesome mysteriousness that is creating, supporting, and ending every visible thing. The failure of humanity is not a lack of experience of X, but the refusal to come to terms with X and to worship X as their life meaning. Such worship means nothing more or less and being realistic, for X is reality with a capital R. Such capitalization is symbolic 
of boundless and inescapable power not created by human hands. X is not a reality created by humans to fit their preferences. X is the reality that undermines every reality created by humans. X is the infinite truth that judges all our finite efforts toward truthfulness as well as all our overt lies. Some will complain that this God of Paul's is not personal. This is not true. It's very personal for Paul. It is his devotion, his papa mama, his cause, his drive, his life, his personal worship, even unto death. The vision of a big person in some parallel universe that assists us to rebel against Paul's ex is then and now sheer illusion. No big person exists. In that sense, Paul is an atheist. He does not trust in the gods that humans create. He only trusts the uncreated creator of his and our lives. If we define existing as emerging or showing up out of nothingness, then Paul's God does not exist. Paul's God is the source of all existing things. Processes, events, happenings, possibilities, past, futures, as well as our freedom to share in the unfoldment of these existing things. Paul's God is that void, that no thingness out of which all existing things show up, have their day and then pass away. And it's not just Christians who have worshiped this God, this one final reality that jealously opposes our worship of anything less. We know this final reality, not with the knowing of our minds, but with the knowing of our core awareness of being aware. Our minds come into play in a secondary fashion. We understood with our minds after, not before, understanding with the heart of our consciousness. I love you're going to find our love. And I, I tell you, love is everywhere. And it, rightly so. I think uh, life is love. Your love. Your love. I am love. All is love. Life is divine. Well, now, we don't act that way. What do we act like? Like, a, well, you're sitting over there and I'm sitting here. Well, I don't like this guy. I don't like that guy and everything else. But, well, the higher we are growing in the spirit dimension is that begins to change. And you see that uh, they talk about the disappearance of uh, the body, the disappearance of the mountain or whatever it is, you know, well, you're giving back the mountain, you're giving back the body and so forth, and this kind of thing. And the body is, uh, in the contemplative tradition, the body is you. you uh, in other words, I see you. I don't see someone over here with a name, uh, just your name. I see you and I see you uh, asking me questions. Are you standing for certain positions or certain things like that that are raising those questions for my life. And that's the way it is. And then when I move into the farmless area of life, well, that disappeared. But when it comes back, you're you, you see. But you're the other, you, your creaturehood that is spoken to me about life. Is, uh, I have to take that to go into the, the further dimension of farmlessness. So I become that, I become more whole at every stage of the step of life. It's more fulfilled in every way as that happens to you. We delude ourselves into thinking that living in the presence of ultimate reality is too exalted, that God is too exalted to be concerned about how things are going with us human beings here in Copenhagen. So we have authentic living at the distance which is really poetry or mythology. A person who worships only in quiet hours, thinks of God only in quiet hours, puts authentic living at a distance, sneaks out of the very thing God wants. That religion is to be introduced right in the middle of the actual life, every day, weekdays, the most strenuous of all, and not to be satisfied with the Sabbath worship, or an hour or half hour each day. Authentic living is nothing else but religion right in the middle of actual life and weekdays, and we have reduced it to quiet hours, thereby indirectly admitting that we are not really being authentic that we should have quiet hours to think about God. This seems so elevated and beautiful, so solemn. 
and it is hypocritical, because in this way we exempt daily life from imitation and from the authentic active worship of God. I am discovering my posture is everything. My interior posture is the orientation I present to every situation and encounter of my life. This posture is deeper than fleeting psychological attitudes. It is something I must continually nurture. Join me in exploring the practices nourishing this interior posture and my presence in everyday life.